So let's talk about attachment. Attachment is a close emotional bond with another person. Uh, oftentimes we're thinking about caregivers, right? Um, so mother, father, uh, caregiver could be grandparents because you can form uh, multiple attachments. But usually we use the word attachment for non-romantic relationships. There is a parallel word that we use to describe romantic relationships, which we talk about as intimacy, right? So attachment's more of a close emotional bond with a caregiver or a non-romantic relationship. Intimacy we use as an emotional bond or deep emotional bond with a romantic partner. So let's talk about attachment though. There are three elements of attachment that are important to discuss body contact, familiarity, and responsive parenting. All three of these elements will drive whether a child has a secure attachment versus a insecure attachment. So let's get into it. So the first piece of attachment is body contact. And there is this old study by Harry Harlow in which he raised uh, monkeys, right? Separate from their actual mother. And then he bred them uh, in two conditions, right? So um, one, they had an artificial mother that provided a biological need, uh, but it wasn't soft and cuddly. So if you look on the far left of this picture, we call this the coil mother, right? So uh, you see the baby bottle, you see the chicken wire wrapped around, and you see a very primitive uh, face for a monkey, right? And then the second uh, fake or artificial mother was a mother that was soft. The, the wire was covered with a terry cloth. So uh, the monkey could lay up against the terry cloth and cuddle with it, right? Now, from a biological point of view, logic would say, which of the monkeys, uh, which of the artificial mothers would the monkeys prefer? From a logic point of view, you might say, hey, the mother that's satisfying the basic needs of a child, the mother that's feeding them. But what we found was that wasn't the case. Overwhelmingly, uh, Harlow's monkeys preferred the cloth mother, even though they weren't feeding them. And what that illustrated was in terms of attachment, body contact was more essential than just addressing a physical need. So body contact builds closeness. Body contact builds a sense of safety. Body contacts build a, a sense of security. Body contact builds attachment. And what I'd like to do is show you uh, a brief video about Harry Harlow and his monkeys. So let me uh, pull that up. Let me show you a monkey raised on a nursing wire mother. Now here are 106's two mothers. As you can see, it was weaned on a wire mother. Here's baby 106. Watch. He's going to the wire mother. He's got to eat to live. He's going back. He's back on the cloth mother, and he'll stay on the cloth mother. 
Actually, this baby spends 17 to 18 hours a day on the clock mother, and less than one hour a day on the wire mother. We had predicted that the variable of contact comfort would be a variable of measurable importance, but we were unprepared to find that it completely overwhelmed and overshadowed all other variables, including those of nursing. Frankly, Doctor, if it comes to a choice between wire and cloth, it's reasonable to expect that any child would go to the cloth. It's a matter of creature comfort, like a baby with its blanket. But is this really love? Well, what do you mean by saying that a baby loves its mother? Certainly one thing we mean is that it gets a great feeling of security in the presence of the mother. Now, Mr. Collingwood, wouldn't you say that if you frightened a baby, that it went running to its mother, was comforted, and then all the fear disappeared and was replaced by a complete sense of security that that baby loved its mother? Now, in this experiment, this is the apparatus we use. That looks diabolical. That's just the way the baby monkey feels about it. Flashing eyes, loud sounds, moving mechanical parts, all of these things are designed to frighten a monkey. Now here we have a peaceful, resting baby monkey. Let's find out what his reaction to his mother are when we frighten him. child will do in a similar situation. He runs away. It's more than running away. He was running to his mother to touch her, to drive away his fear. Contact with the mother changes his entire personality. Look, now he's actually threatening the diabolical mother. This gives us part of the picture of the strength of infantal love. This is a six-foot square room with a few toys and other objects, but to the monkey, it's much more menacing. We know that when our own children are taken to a strange place without their mothers, they are often overwhelmed with fear. This room is just such a new and strange environment for the baby monkeys. No mother is in there. Now, let's put a monkey into the room. Notice how closely he enters the room. He's searching for comfort, but nothing relieves his disturbance. Now we'll take the baby monkey out and put in a wire mother. Now this one was nursed by a wire mother. That's right. All his life. She doesn't seem to help much. Now we'll try the same test with a cloth mother in the room. You see the contrast in the behavior? Despite the fact that the wire mother nursed him, she could offer this infant nothing in the way of affection or security. But here the monkey, by rubbing against the cloth mother, as if he were seeking as much contact comfort as he could get, builds up his reservoir of affection and security. First, his body relaxes as the fear disappears. But above and beyond this, new positive response patterns appear. He now goes out to explore and investigate this new strange world. He is now a normal, 
happy, curious baby. So what are your reactions to the video? I feel bad for the monkey. Okay, that's fair, right? So I appreciate that point. In fact, there are many people who argue that this study was considered unethical by modern standards. And I know when we talked about research, we said we have guidelines for um, how we're supposed to interact with humans in research. There are guidelines how we're supposed to interact with animals in research. And perhaps if someone applied to do this same study today, it would not be allowed to be done, right? So uh, the sentiment of feeling bad, uh, yeah, I get that wholeheartedly. Uh, any other thoughts uh, related to attachment or uh, larger uh, pickups from the video? So um, any other thoughts? What I think was powerful, right, is because the interviewer was asking him about love and, you know, how do we know it's love, not just creature comfort? I thought the second and third piece uh, did a good job depicting attachment. Now, maybe the word love should not have been used, but certainly attachment could be, right? Uh, so in a fearful situation, having that body contact provided comfort. Having that body contact uh, provided security. So uh, to the point where after feeling secure, the the monkey was able to push back, push back against uh, whatever the environmental threat was. The second thing was having that security and comfort allowed the child to feel safe to navigate their environment. And, and that's true, right? If we were to think about uh, children and the playground, one, it's not uncommon if you were to take a young child to the playground for them to look for you periodically, to know that you're there. And if they're uh, nervous or whatever, they'll run up to you and then they'll go back to playing because they feel that security, they feel that comfort. Um, so there are a lot of meaningful findings in Harlow's study, despite the fact that we we do critique him and we do critique the ethical nature of this study. So the second piece of attachment is familiarity. Remember how we said uh, that children will uh, start to recognize individuals who are important and consistently in their life. So familiarity is an incredible piece of the puzzle for attachment. Now, another researcher by the name of Conrad Lorenz demonstrated this in goslings uh, or little ducks, right? And what he did was he capitalized on the concept of imprinting. Many animal models, they develop a bond with an organism in their environment and that becomes their form of attachment. Now with ducklings or goslings, when they hatch, the first thing they usually see is their mother or caregiver, right? Because uh, in an avian model, birds usually stay next to the nest or next to the eggs where they're being hatched to defend against predators, right? So when an egg hatches and this chickling comes out or gosling comes out, um, the bird's gonna say, okay, that's my mother. And they're gonna become attached to it to the point where they will follow uh, their mother everywhere, right? 
Now, in an animal model, we talked about uh, critical periods versus sensitive periods. In an animal model, it's all or none. So if we were to have a duckling hatch and there was a uh, caregiver there, they would bond to it. They would imprint on it, right? That would be their attachment. If they were to hatch and nothing is around, they would not develop an attachment to anything. They would feel isolated. And what Conrad Lorenz did was he made sure he was the first uh, organism these goslings found or saw. And sure enough, these ducklings followed Conrad Lorenz everywhere he went. So when he was walking on land, they would follow him as if he were uh, their mother. When he was swimming in a lake, they would swim behind him in classic duck fashion. So he demonstrated that there is this imprinting, there is this bond that comes from familiarity. So in an animal model, I said it's all or none. So if enough time passes and you don't, you don't have any exposure, you're going to feel unattached. With human beings, it's more of a sensitive period. So we develop a bond to those people who are most familiar in our environment. But that has to happen early in our development. Now, this could perhaps explain why if you have um, a person who's raised uh, by adoptive parents or raised in a single parent household, and then uh, the biological parent or the other parent who might have left the family comes back and they try and form a bond with the child, uh, it's much harder the older they are. And it, it it's not uncommon if it happens in adulthood that that bond is pretty superficial. So that attachment that was supposed to occur didn't occur. And because of that, uh, it's severely interrupted, right? So um, this happens, you know, this happens in our society when people resurface, right, uh, in our lives. But if they missed our childhood, if they missed those important periods, those formative years, it's much harder to build a bond with them. So familiarity, Conrad Lorenz added to the mix. And then last but not least, we have responsive parenting. So I always tell parents that if you are just an average parent, but you're addressing the needs of your child, your child will thrive in the world. So you don't have to be the best parent in the world. You just have to be responsive. That means addressing the needs of your child. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're cold, give them clothing or a blanket. If they're in pain, address their um, their wounds or whatever is causing pain. And that's all you need to do. Now, Mary Ainsworth did a really cool uh, study, which she called the strange, ro uh, str strange room or strange situation procedure. And what she did was she had a, um, a mother and their child come into a playroom and they would sit in a playroom and they would, uh, you know, play with the toys or whatnot. And then all of a sudden, a stranger would enter the room. Now, when the stranger enters the room, that uh, should trigger uh, stranger anxiety, right? Now, what happens is a stranger first comes in the room, they're silent, then they start to talk to the mother, and then they start to try and play with the child. And then something remarkable happens. Mom leaves the room, and now the child is uh, interacting with the stranger alone. And then mom comes back, the stranger leaves, and then the child is left alone and the mom comes back again. So this is the strange situation procedure. Now, obviously Mary Ainsworth and uh, the mother are looking on the other side of a 
a one-way mirror so they could still see in the playroom. And they wanted to measure, Mary Ainsworth wanted to measure um, the reaction to mom's coming, mom's going, uh, and the reaction to the stranger, right? So what, what did she find? Well, she found that there, and I'm gonna go out of order, uh, because I want to talk about secure versus insecure, but there's type A, type B, type C kinds of reactions. A secure attachment is one where the child is bothered, mildly bothered when mom leaves, but is comforted by her return. Similar to Harlow's monkeys when they ran up to the cloth mother. That, that cloth mother served as a comfort. So we expect in a case of a secure attachment, you to be bothered by mom leaving uh, and we expect stranger anxiety to be elicited. And then when mom comes back, we expect you to be comforted by her return. So that's the ideal. However, there are some people who have an insecure uh, attachment and they come in different forms, right? So insecure avoidant and insecure resistant attachment. An insecure avoidant attachment is really the best way to describe this child is somewhat apathetic. When mom leaves, the child is not bothered at all. It doesn't bother them. And when mom comes back, they don't approach mom for comfort. So her coming and going does nothing in the sense of comfort, right? So that's an insecure avoidant attachment. There is another possibility though. There's an insecure resistant attachment. And that's one where instead of being mildly distressed by mom leaving, there is more of a severe distress that's elicited by mom leaving. And when mom comes back, not only does the child not seek out mom's comfort, but if mom tries to comfort the child, they will resist contact. So they might push her away. They might kick her, they might try and bite her. So these three uh, predictable reactions are uh, how we identify attachment, right? So, uh, and you could imagine if a child is upset or frustrated by the parent leaving them with a stranger and it's severe enough, you can have uh, resistance to comfort. Uh, so, and if you work in a daycare system, I'm sure you've seen this before. Now, but is it all the parents, right? So we have to understand that attachment isn't just about the parents. It's also about the child's temperament. Now we define temperament as uh, one's biologically wired emotional reactivity, right? So children are wired differently and they respond to distress differently. So Thomas and Chess uh, talked about different kinds of temperaments in children. So he described an, uh, or they described an easy child, which generally speaking is positive, optimistic. They uh, adapt well to their environments and they cope well. So this child is less likely to pull strong emotional reactions out of a parent. So they're cooperative, they're easygoing, they're positive. So you're going to interact with that child more gently and more supportive. We also have a slow to warm up child. Now a slow to warm up child, they, they also have a positivity about them, but they're more apprehensive. They're, uh, they take more time to adapt to their new environment there is a little more nervousness in the, in the beginning, but they do eventually cope. They do eventually adjust and adapt. And then there is what they describe as the difficult child. And the difficult child uh, by nature tends to be more negative, tends to be more resistant to change. Uh, they fight adapting to new situations. So they're pushing back. 
which is going to affect how parents relate to the those children, right? So you're going to interact with a child that's categorized with a difficult temperament differently than an easier, slow to warm up temperament. Now, let's talk about the parenting styles. Now, uh, Diane Baumrind uh, came up with the first three of these parenting styles, and then a fourth was added. Uh, Baumrind talks about authoritarian, authoritative, permissive, and uninvolved parents. So let me explain what they are. An authoritarian parent has high standards or demands and lacks warmth. So you so there's high expectations on the child and there's limited comfort, emotional support, et cetera. An authoritative parent has also has high demands, but it's coupled with love, warmth, and support. The goal is to be as authoritative as possible. A permissive parent has low demands, but has a whole lot of warmth. So they're, they're oftentimes trying to be friends with their kids rather than being parents, right? And then uh, what Diane Baumrin didn't say, but was added later is there's also the possibility of an uninvolved parent, which, shows limited warmth and limited demands. So that's more of a neglectful parent. So here we have these four parenting styles and we believe uh, certainly in Western societies that uh, the authoritative parent is the gold standard because you're teaching uh, independence, you're reinforcing a person doing the right thing, but you're not saying it's okay, nothing, don't worry about it, right? So I'll share with you a story. I had a student uh, many years ago who talked about a situation where uh, there was a large snowstorm and they dug themselves out and they got into a car accident. And what, what happened was the parent was like, are you okay, right? And that's a normal reaction, right? Checking to make sure your kid's okay. But what followed wasn't helpful. It's okay. It's not your fault. Well, whose fault was it? Was it the other driver? I asked the student about that. He said, no, I uh, hit a parked car. So now it's the other person's fault for parking on the side of the road, right? Um and uh, that's not logical, right? So clearly this person chose to dig themselves out. And um, yeah, they got into an accident. It indeed was their fault, but the parents like, it's not your fault, it's okay. And proceeded to uh, pay to repair the car without any consequence to the child. That is a good example of permissive parenting. An authoritative parent would start with the same thing. Are you okay? The child says, yes, I'm okay. Do you know where the insurance cards are? The child says, yes. Then the parent would say, I love you, but you have to handle this with uh, the police and give them your information. And I'm here for you when you're home, right? So that uh, encourages the child to take responsibility for their actions and be more responsible. So what we see is the choice of parenting uh, affects the later development of the child, right? So a permissive parent leads to a more uh, dependent and impulsive child, which categorically tends to be less mature. An authoritarian parent uh, who's rigid and stern uh, and shows no warmth that creates distance in a child. They'll withdraw. They tend to be more anxious, tend to be more insecure. So an authoritarian parent in that scenario wouldn't even necessarily ask their child if they were okay. They would say, what are you stupid? Why did you do that? You should have known better with no empathy whatsoever. So that's going to 
make children withdraw or retreat from you. Um, and then we have uh, the authoritative parent, which we said is the ideal. The child's more independent, more curious, more competent, and uninvolved. This is the neglectful parent uh, leads to low self-esteem. It's kind of like the, the, the kid feels that nobody cares, why bother? And that oftentimes leads to anger and resentments and rebellion, right? Because if you don't see me, I'm going to make you see me. So a lot of school problems emerge as a function of uh, the uninvolved parenting. Now, the last thing I will tell you before I uh, uh, press pause is what happened with Harlow's monkeys? And I know we said, okay, I feel bad for them. Uh, those monkeys who lived in isolation, who uh, were not able to interact with a cloth, cloth mother, they tended to be more fearful, right? They cowered in, in fright. And this is a picture of, or a still picture of a video of one of the monkeys who's so fearful that they just doubled over into a ball. They cowered in fright, right? Uh, some were more aggressive, right? Some had no interest. The female monkeys had no interest in mating as a function of lack of attachment. And the ones that were artificially impregnated, they oftentimes failed to care for or were neglectful to their own kids. So the, the punchline is attachment is so important. How you take care of your kids especially at a young age is so important because it's going to affect how they relate to the world. It, it, it's going to affect how safe and secure they view themselves in the world. So be compassionate, be supportive, be present, provide comfort and your, and your children will grow into healthy adults. So I'm going to stop there and um, yeah.